This means war. Today's message is a reminder that life is not a playground. It is a battleground. And that is why Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 6, if you're with me in verse 10, follow along as I read aloud. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against mere flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert, keep alert, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me. The words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. One of my favorite stories of all time is the story of the pumpkin farmer who made his living off selling pumpkins. One day he woke up to find that several of the pumpkins in his pumpkin patch were missing and he didn't know why. Then he woke up the next day and several more were missing. He couldn't figure it out until finally after a week, day after day, more and more pumpkins kept disappearing and he realized there was a thief afoot. And the pumpkin farmer who makes his living off selling pumpkins started asking, what do I do? And he came up with a clever idea. He, put out, or he pulled out a sign made of wood and put with paint on it, one of these pumpkins is poisoned. Put it out in the middle of his pumpkin patch, put it right in the center, and he thought, hopefully this will work. He went to bed, woke up the next morning, none of his pumpkins were missing. He was so satisfied that he had outsmarted the thief and that he was finally safe. But then he woke up the next day and he walked out, and again, he saw that his pumpkins were still there, none were missing, but his sign had been moved. And as he walked up to it, he noticed that someone had crossed out the one and painted over it, T-W-O. Now two pumpkins are poisoned, and he had to throw the whole crop out. It's frustrating when you feel like you've been outsmarted, isn't it? And that's how the spiritual battle is. It's a battle in the mind. It's a battle in your heart. It's a battle for truth. And when you feel like you've been outwitted and outsmarted by the enemy, it's frustrating because it impacts all of life. And that's exactly why Paul is putting this section at the very end of his grand opus, the book of Ephesians, is because he's telling us at the end of everything that Paul has written about the family and about marriage and work and witness and relationships and purity and holiness and kingdom aspirations, if we're outsmarted by the enemy, the enemy can destroy it all. And that's why we are called at the end of this book to fight back. But we have to recognize this morning that as we think about fighting in this spiritual battle, we recognize that we're not fighting for victory. Why? Because Christ already won. We fight from victory because we've already won. And so it changes the game completely, doesn't it? You get on the football field or you get on the basketball court, you get on the soccer match, and if you know that you've already won the game, it changes how you play. We've already won the war. We've just got to keep fighting. And so how do we do that this morning? I want to unpack this verse by verse, and I want to give you three thoughts this morning. If we're going to fight back the right way, we need to know our enemy, 
We need to put on our armor, and we need to remember we're stronger together. Put on or know your enemy, put on your armor, and remember that we are stronger together. But let's begin with prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Father, I pray, God, that you would direct our minds and our hearts now to the realm that we cannot see, we cannot hear, but that affects everything that we do. There is a spiritual battle going on even now around us for our attention and for our affections. And we pray, God, that we will give you them both. Father, we pray now, change us as a result of your word. Pray in Jesus' name, amen. Step one, if you're going to fight back in this spiritual battle, you need to know your enemy. Verse 10 says this, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Notice that first word he says, finally. What Paul is doing here in this letter is he is giving us some concluding thoughts. And Paul is saying that God's overarching plan throughout history has been to make for himself a family. And not just a family, a family of families, an earthly outpost of heavenly citizens who have been adopted from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different races, different everything, and brought us all together into one family. And he has made us alive. Those of us who were dead in our sins have been made alive in Christ. He has torn down the walls of the things that would separate us and divide us, and he has given us a common mission to work together on. And so he says, in light of all of that, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Why are we called to be strong? Why are we called to put on the armor of God? Well, here's the reason why. Because we are called to resist the attacks of the enemy. Our enemy has many names. Satan, devil, angel of light, Beelzebub. The list goes on and on and on. But here's the point. Our enemy hates us hates us. He hates the church. He hates the universal church. He hates the local church. He hates the family. He hates the family of families. And our enemy's purpose for being is to destroy the family. I think there's no mistake, there's no coincidence that four to 7,000 churches every year, I don't know what the stat is, but I see it all the time from various places. So there's gotta be some measure of truth to it. The four to 7,000 churches every single year close their doors forever because Satan hates the church. It's no mistake and it's no coincidence that 1,700 pastors in 2016 left the ministry every month. 1,300 are terminated every month. One in 10 pastors make it to retirement as pastors. One in 10. The enemy hates the church, and the bullseye is always on the leadership's back. And make no mistake about it, he hates your family too. If you're a believing family, if you're a family that has placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins, the enemy hates your family. And he will do everything within his power to rip it apart to shreds. Is that eye-opening? It's sobering when we recognize that our enemy is real and our enemy hates and our enemy destroys. And that's why he says here in the text, verse 10, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might by putting on the whole armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the enemy. The word schemes here in the text comes from the Greek word method, uh, methodia, which is where we get the idea of method. It was a word that was used during Paul's time to describe a wild animal who would cunningly stalk and then unexpectedly pounce on its prey. It carried the idea of craftiness and cunningness and deception. 
a couple days ago I was watching, or actually a couple months ago, I was um, looking for some videos to help uh, give an illustration on the lion and the lamb and some eschatology stuff in the future. And, and I found this video on YouTube. You can just type in lion and the lamb. And this lion, this big, big lion, is carrying around this little lamb in its mouth. And at first, it's a beautiful picture. You look at this thing, and it's carrying it around. It's so gentle, and it's delicate, and it's licking it and cleaning it, puts its paw down on its, on its foot and just kind of takes care of it, and it's crying and cooing. And all the while, you're thinking to yourself, wow, oh, this is a beautiful picture of one day the lion will lay down with the lamb. And then this zoologist down in the comments section says, he's not caring for it. He's waiting for mom to come rescue it so he can have a bigger meal. A lion is deceptive. It's a tactic. It's a scheme. And that is what our enemy does, is he deceives us and lures us into false senses of hope and security so that then he can attack. And here are some of the schemes that he will commonly use, I have discovered throughout life and in the scriptures, that Satan will use to destroy us. Number one, lies. He's the father of lies. He's the originator of lies. In fact, the very first thing he did when he attacked in the garden was he lied to Adam and Eve. And make no mistake about it, your enemy will whisper lies, distortions, and half-truths into your heart and into your mind to poison your soul. Consider rat poison. Rat poison is 99% candy to a rat and 1% poison. And what happens? It dies. That is what Satan does. He wants to give you just enough truth that you'll buy into the lie and then Secondly, he uses deception. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 through 15 tells us that he's an angel of light. He's the great pretender. Our enemy pretends to be something that he's not all the time. He makes sin look like something it's not. He makes sin look beautiful when it's actually nothing but death. He makes his servants look like something they're not. He will shroud them in sheep's clothes when in fact they're nothing but wolves. And they will enter in In fact, the last warning that the Ephesians were given was to watch out for the wolves that would come in and deceive. And what they do is they profess enough truth to get into the church and to win people's ears and to win people's hearts, and they're really nice people, and then they introduce deceptive doctrines to destroy churches and families. That's what the enemy does. Number three, temptation. He'll lure you away with and from the narrow path of faith and obedience with pleasures, trinkets, and treasures. I think the enemy just loves to appeal to our desire for immediate gratification. Number four, he's a thief. Our enemy is a thief. Mark chapter six, verses four through, uh, chapter four, verses one through nine tells us that he steals the seed of God's word from our hearts. Now, I don't have a ton of clarity around how that works, how he steals the seed of God's word from the heart, but Jesus tells us that he can do it, and I believe Jesus. So somehow we recognize that Satan is able to choke out our faith and our confidence in the word of God. Have you ever been there? Intimidation. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8 tells us that Satan is a roaring lion seeking someone that he may devour. You ever been in the presence of a roaring lion? It's incredibly intimidating. And Satan, when he roars, he will make you think twice before standing against him. And if you cannot stand your ground somehow, you will wilt and run every time. He roars. And finally, we need to recognize he's a pack hunter. Look at verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, in other words, the physical realm, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, this spiritual realm, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, I wish I had time to unpack this more. We will come back to this idea, but here's what we need to understand is that Our enemy is a pack hunter. He does not hunt alone. 
When you're out in the wilderness, if you watch videos on YouTube of how lions hunt, when a lion roars, oftentimes he's not roaring because he's attacking. He's roaring to scare so that the prey will run right into the pack that's waiting to devour. We need to understand that our enemy never works alone. He's got a massive system that impacts our real world that is working against us as the church to defeat us and to destroy us. Wow. Our enemy is powerful. And I think the thing that we need to recognize is that oftentimes we underestimate just how powerful our enemy can be. And so the first thing that we need to recognize is oftentimes we put our enemies into, or we think of our enemy, the devil, as in one of two ditches. The first ditch is we see the devil under every rock. Devil made me do it. It's his fault. And we blame Satan for everything. And what that allows us to do is to avoid personal accountability and responsibility. Because that's not true. He doesn't make us do everything. But then the other ditch is to think that, well, we never think about our enemy. We never consider the fact that our enemy is at work in our lives and has real and living impact in our lives. And so these are the two ditches. So here's what we need to do in the text. We need to recognize and know that our enemy is real. Do you believe it? Say amen. That he hates. And that he is scheming against you right now to destroy your life for the Lord. So... If our enemy is on the attack, how do we stand firm? Point number two, put on your armor. Put on your armor. Do you feel vulnerable yet? If you don't feel vulnerable right now, then you're going to walk out of this auditorium unchanged. If you don't do point number two, you are completely vulnerable to the lion who wants to shred you to pieces. So point number two, put on the armor of God. Look at what it says in verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. Verse 14, stand therefore. Three times in the text, Paul says to stand, stand firm, stand against. This is a military term that military officers would use to, uh, to say resist the enemy. I'm a little hot right here, if we can turn it down just a little bit, Matthew. If I get going at all, I don't need a lot of help. (laughs) This is a military term that meant to resist, is that good? Okay. It's a military term that meant to resist the enemy, to hold the line, to stand your ground, to give no surrender. Well, how do we do that? How on earth are we supposed to stand our ground, hold the line, not surrender, don't give up, resist? How are we supposed to do that when we have an enemy that is so incredibly powerful that we can't see, that we can't hear, that we can't touch? How are we supposed to do that? Well, look at what it says in the text, verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, not some of it. Not what you think is comfortable, not what you need today, not what is, whatever is your preference, put on the whole armor of God. And remember, Paul is in a prison cell and he's changed to a, a, a guard all day long. So every single day, Mario, he's looking at one of these guards and he has a visible representation of what this guard looks like. And so he uses this picture that he sees every day to draw an analogy for us of how to stand against our enemy. And so he says this in verse 13. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, verse 14, having fastened the belt of truth around your waist. The belt of capital T truth. Not little t truth, if I cut my arm, I'm going to bleed out. But capital T truth, that is Truth revealed in the person of Jesus Christ and written down by inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the word of God for us. Put on the belt of truth. Hold up your Bible. This is your belt. This is your belt. 
Belts during the Roman day, if a Roman soldier had a belt that was not cinched together, that meant nothing was held together. His armor was not held together. His clothes were not held together. But when the, uh, the soldier would pull the belt together and cinch it up, it held everything in place. This book is intended by God's design to be the truth in your life that holds you together when everything threatens to fall apart. Put on the belt of truth. Secondly, put on the, verse 14, put on the breastplate of righteousness. There's some debate over whether or not this speaks to salvation or personal holiness. I think because he speaks later to the helmet of salvation that this is speaking to personal holiness. So in other words, put on personal holiness. What does he mean by that? Well, the breastplate was something that a soldier would put on to protect all the vital organs. The breastplate would protect the lungs, the heart, the kidneys, the liver, the stomach. It would protect it all from life-threatening um, attack. Holiness is a life lived in light of God's truth. A lot of us have a ton of information about the word of God, but God says what really matters is not so much information, but transformation. Are you living in light of God's word? Are you seeking to put its principles in action? Because if you're not, you're not putting on the breastplate of righteousness, which protects the vital organs of your life, your family, your legacy, your testimony, your kingdom aspirations, holy living in God's power is a protective covering to the most precious organs of your life. Number three, he says here in the text, verse 15, as to shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Now, Paul understood that Roman soldiers, when they would wear shoes, they weren't just a pair of slippers. They were like football cleats, and they would have spikes on the bottom. And the purpose was that a Roman soldier in battle is always advancing and never retreating. He is always advancing. In fact, the amount of armor that he had on his back was minimal to none because a Roman soldier is always advancing forward. And when we think about advance, what, what are we taking forward? What are we doing? Well, Paul says, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. That means that every single morning when we wake up, a part of putting on the armor of God is not simply putting on our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but our willingness to share it with those who don't know him. And I feel like some of us, maybe, feel like we're, we're scooting backwards in life and we can't figure out why? When was the last time you prayed that God would use you to share your faith with someone else? If you're not advancing, you're retreating. Put your shoes on and share your faith. Now I get it, it's hard, it's difficult. And that's why I'm thankful for Pastor Scott, who's going to take us through the book of Philippians this summer and continue to teach us how and give us resources in our hands. And hey, here's a book. Read this book. It'll change your life. Amen? Put on your shoes. Fourthly, one, two, three. Fourthly, take up the shield of faith. Verse 15, having put on the readiness of the gospel of peace. And verse 16, in all circumstances, taking up the shield of faith, which you, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Here's the deal. Uh, your enemy is firing away at you every single day. And when you're tired and you're exhausted and you're weary and you let your shield down, that's when the arrows hit in your heart and in your mind and discourage you and make you weary and you just want to quit. Have you ever been there? Okay. So a Roman soldier, what they would do is they'd not only have a, a shield, which was made of wood, but then they would cover it in leather and they would dip it in water so that if the enemy would attack with flaming arrows, it would put the arrow out and they would still be safe. What is Paul trying to say in all of this? Here is my takeaway. The shield of faith 
represents our confidence in God's word and his promises. Not that we simply know them, but we live by them, we enact upon them, we, we trust them with our very lives to do them. When the word of God simply becomes this thing that we do on Sundays, nothing more than academic, nothing more than, how do we put it a couple of weeks ago, auditing the class. We've got a dry shield that Satan's gonna be able to destroy very easily. We've got to put this into action. That's the shield of faith. Fifthly, he says here in the text, in verse 17, take up the helmet of salvation. Helmets were important in battle because here's the thing, in battle, you can lose extremities and survive, but you can't lose your head. If you're not saved, hear me, church, look at me. Maybe you've been going to church your whole life. Maybe you've been part of the church your whole life. Maybe you've said the prayer. Maybe you've been a self-righteous person your whole life and you tithe and you recycle and you care about social things, great. But if you are not born again, if the Holy Spirit of God has not come inside of you and given you new life, you have no helmet on your head, you are vulnerable, and at the end of the day, if you die without the helmet of salvation, Christ's finished work for you on the cross. You can't go into eternity without your head. Are we tracking? And finally, the sword of the Spirit, verse 17. Take up the helmet of salvation of the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This is fascinating here in this text because Paul oftentimes will use a different word to describe the word, word. Does that make sense? So let me, let me give you the actual, what it says in the Greek. It says in verse 17, take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the rhema of God. Now, typically when Paul uses uh, these words, he usually uses the word logos. Logos is the entirety of God's word. This is the logos. Jesus is the living word. This is the written logos. Does that make sense? Everybody tracking? Paul here in the text, though, uses a different word, which is rhema, which is not the big word, but a specific word. It's kind of like going into a battle for a Roman soldier with a broadsword that weighs 10 pounds versus a hand-to-hand -hand combat sword that's about six inches long, weighs very little, and is easy to maneuver. And my takeaway from this is this. When you go into battle, and you're in the heat of the battle, and you're facing temptation or struggle at work, or a boss is asking you to do something that you want to do, and you know that God's word speaks to something that you are struggling with, here's the problem. If you just be like, in the battle, in the heat of the moment, where was that verse that speaks to this in my life? Man, I know that's a verse. I got to call Pastor Scott, because I, Pastor Scott, isn't there a verse that speaks to lust? Isn't there a verse that speaks to lying at, at work? Isn't there a verse that talks about and then by that moment, the enemy's already won. That's the broadsword. What Paul is telling us to do is have a specific word in your back pocket to fight back. That means that you've memorized. When you are facing the heat of the battle, you need to have memorized scripture in your back pocket to fight the battle. Guys, that moment when your, your phone is tempting you to look at something that you know you shouldn't, you need to have the word of God, the only offensive weapon in the spiritual battle to fight back against the enemy. And some of you are thinking right now, well, is it really... The word of God is living and active and powerful and strong, and some of us don't think it's that important. And the reality is, if you're trying to fight your spiritual battle without the word of God, you're gonna lose every single time. Take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and fight, fight. But you can't fight without it. 
And you need to have something in your back pocket that you can fight back when you are in the battle. I think I've shared this story several times, and I'll, I'll share it again. It's one of my favorites. Uh, I met a guy several years ago. His name was Tom Hemingway, and he fought in the Vietnam War. And while he was over in Vietnam, he uh, made friends uh, with an ally there. His name was T. He was a Vietnamese soldier. He was an ally uh, over there in the fight. And um, as he was standing with T one day, he found out that T was an interesting guy because Pastor Scott, I haven't done this in a while, and I'm going to be gone for a while, so I, I get to do this one more time. A T, when he was standing, would always have a nine millimeter gun in his side holster with a magazine clip, safety off, and cocked. And he'd always have it in his side pocket. So in other words, you never wanted to stand right here when you're standing next to T, right? You don't want to stand there. And so I remember one day, uh, Tom was telling me about this, and he asked T, why on earth do you keep a gun with a magazine Cocked, loaded, ready to fire at all times, safety off. And T just simply responded, need gun, need quick. Tom thought, okay, doesn't make any sense to me. So one day they get, it's a nice afternoon, they get into the Jeep, they start uh, driving down this road together. It's a nice afternoon, Tom is enjoying uh, the nice afternoon, and he sees off in the distance a man is coming their way, doesn't think anything of it, and the man keeps getting closer, he's on a bike, he's got a backpack on, doesn't think anything of it, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, T sits up, pulls out his gun, shoots him between the eyes, he goes flopping down into the side of the road, and all of a sudden explodes into a million pieces. They pull over the car, They go over to the side of the road. They're looking around at everything. And Tom asks T, what on earth happened? Why on earth did you do that? And he explained, this man had a backpack on his back loaded with C4. There was a little puff of white smoke, which was the ignition. He had set it off on a timer. He was going to take it off and put it in their Jeep. And if he did not stand and fire they would have died. Tom stood there, and he said to T, need gun? Need quick. Here's the point. When you're in the heat of the battle and the enemy's coming, you don't have time to start flipping around, the, wait, where was that verse that I needed right now in the heat of the battle? You need to have it memorized at the tip of your tongue so that when the enemy is coming, You can fire back. This is your offensive weapon. Amen? And then finally, in verses 18 through 20, he gives us our marching orders. And I don't have a lot of time to unpack this, but verse 18 says, praying at all times in the spirit, with all prayer and supplication to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me that words may be given to me, here's the marching orders, and open me my mouth boldly around these Roman centurion guards to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I might boldly declare it as I speak. Here's what Paul is saying. In the midst of all of this, Our mission as a church is to be salt and light in a dark and dying world to advance the good news of Jesus in whatever situation we find ourselves in. If we're chained to a Roman centurion, then we have a captive audience to share the good news. We are ambassadors for Jesus Christ, but you can't be a good ambassador unless you have suited up and put on the armor because Satan, the enemy, will take you out. Put on the armor. And finally, Paul reminds us here in verses 21 through 24, we are stronger together. Hashtag stronger together. Verse 21 says this, so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. Tychicus, Tychicus, Tychicus. This is one of those names that you hope you don't have to read at small group, right? Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister of the Lord, will tell you everything. 
I've sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that, my, uh, that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to you, brothers, and love with faith from the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with you all who love our Lord Jesus with love incorruptible. Here's the thing. It's easy to skip over these portions of scripture, isn't it? It's okay. You can, you can admit it. I sometimes do as well. And it's It's easy to miss the fact that there are real people here in this text to whom we are eternally indebted to. What do I mean by that? Look back at verse 21. So that you also may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. Now, if you understand that Paul is writing this letter from Rome to send to the Ephesians, then you understand that Tychicus is the mailman. And not only that, but this is before we had email. This is before we had the U.S. Postal Service. We didn't have a mail delivery system. So back then, if you wanted to deliver a letter, you had to send someone who was willing to travel the 1,200-mile journey from Rome to Ephesus. And note that if you were to travel 15 miles a day, And that doesn't take into account land and sea and taking days off and stopping to see other people. It would take you three months to get that letter all the way to Ephesus. But if it were not for people like Tychicus who were willing to do the hard work, we would not have the books of Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, which are the prison epistles. If it weren't for people like that, we wouldn't have major parts of the word of God. Here's the point. Paul wrote it, Tychicus delivered it, and the Ephesians and us have benefited. Hashtag stronger together. Amen? I think sometimes we just underestimate how important the body is is, how important the family is. We lose sight of the fact that we all have a massive, significant role in the body and the purposes of God, eternal God, and his kingdom and his glory. We just forget that. Cheryl, can I call you up? I love watching you lead our church in worship. And to just see what God is doing in and through you. When I see you up there, it, sometimes it moves me to tears. And to watch you worship and then to lead me in worship. Pastor Scott, to, to sit under your preaching. I remember the, the last time I was sitting under your preaching, I was, I was sitting right back there. And uh, Craig, I think I was sitting right next to, I wasn't sitting next to you, but I was in the seat next to you. And I just remember sitting there thinking to myself, I could listen to this guy preach all day long. I love. And now you have the blessing of listening to him preach all summer long. Amen. And you have been in so many ways when my arms have been weary, the Aaron who has held my arms up when I have struggled. And I thank you for that. And we have had our battles and we have had, we have duked it out at the office and we have had uh, our tough talks and we are so close because of it. And I'm so thankful for your willingness this summer to step into the pulpit. Dalton, we've been in this since the beginning, man. And to watch you grow up into the godly young man, well, you're 27 now, you're not super young anymore. (laughs) I was ni- he was 19 when we started this? That's crazy. And to see how God has worked in you and through you, I'm thankful that I'm not in this alone. And I'm thankful that I've been able to do it with you. As I think of the myriad of people in our church, staff, elders, deacons, directors, small group leaders and coaches, serving teams, all of you, We're not in this alone, we're in this together, and we need each other. 
But here's the thing, remember, they will not know us by our proximity to one another. They'll know us by our love. And that means we need to be family. Let me close with this. One of my favorite videos of all time on YouTube, I don't know why I'm talking about YouTube so much today, but (laughs) one of my favorite videos on YouTube of all time is what's called the Battle of Kruger. You can look at it this afternoon. The Battle of Kruger is out, I don't know where Kruger is at, it's some wildlife preserve. And around this little lake is this massive herd of water buffalo. And out wanders this little water buffalo, this baby water buffalo, all by itself, frolicking, playing, having fun, skipping, hopping, jumping around, oblivious to the fact that there are two crouching lions 50 feet away. All of a sudden, these lions pounce up, run over, grab the water buffalo. The water buffalo tries to run into the water to get away, but as soon as he gets into the water, this alligator pops up out of nowhere and starts biting at the water buffalo. So the water buffalo is trying to get out of the water, but then the lions are trying to pull him. So he's being pulled from both directions. You ever felt like that? Life has just got you at both ends and pulling both ways and trying to rip you apart. Finally, the lions, they win the battle. They pull the water buffalo up onto the land. The alligator lets go. The battle looks all but over, and this little water buffalo looks all but done. And someone is videotaping this whole thing. And then all of a sudden, they zoom out. You think this thing is dead. They've already started chewing. The camera zooms out, and you see this massive collection of hundreds of of water buffalo coming back over to the baby's rescue. They come over, it's hundreds, I mean hundreds of water buffalo, and they all stomp over, and they all start circling around these seven lions that had all circled around this little baby water buffalo, and they're already starting to chew on them, and they start kicking, and they start hitting, and it was kind of like fifth cuffs, I don't know what it was, but it was somehow, and they get all the lions to run off, the little baby gets up, he rejoins the herd, and they walk off together. That is what the church is supposed to look like. Satan is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And God has gone to so much work to make us family. We are called and responsible to care and to look after each other and to love each other when it's hard and it's inconvenient and it stinks and it's no fun and it costs us. Because the alternative, alternative is that Satan destroys. Church, we need to be that for each other. And as we close out the book of Ephesians, that's what I see Paul living out. And so I leave you with this, church. We are stronger together, but we have to know our enemy and we've got to put on our army. And I thank you, church, for your willingness to let Miranda and I and our kids this summer, in a small sense, get our armor back on. It's been a long, tough three years of ministry. We have loved every minute of it, don't get us wrong. We love you. We love our church, and we will miss our time here over the summer dearly. But as we have poured into you, know this, you are now pouring into us through this sabbatical. And because of that, we are beyond grateful. So we thank you, we love you, we'll miss you, and I can't wait to come back in the fall. And if you think I'm loud now, I can't wait to see what I'm going to be like when I got 100% energy. But no, I um, just pray that God would use this time. But we're also praying for you that God would continue to grow us as a people and as a church and as a family. Because God is building his church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Father, we love you. We thank you for this time to meet in your word. And now, Father, help us to put on the armor. God, we know our enemy is terrifying. He's, he's a scoundrel. He is... Very powerful, but Lord, he's nothing when we put on the armor. 
and we can stand. And in fact, you tell us when we stand against him in your strength and in your power, he'll flee. So God, help us to put on this armor that you speak of. And help us not to forget the fact that we're an army and we're a family and we're meant to do this together. Help us to do that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.